There we go. Good morning or afternoon or evening. Welcome here to the Scripture Habit. Welcome to this community and space uh, resource. Our goal is to help you develop the habit of getting into Scripture every day. It's a worthwhile habit, but we know it's not an easy one. So we show up and say, hey, we'll look through Scripture together. We'll meet you and we'll read it, right? My name is Rebecca Palmatier. I'm a pastor. I get to be a host here at the Scripture Habit, and I say welcome and hello. We are in the book of Hosea, the prophet Hosea. Today we're going to be starting on chapter 12, and I'm going to go ahead and wait just a second for friends to join us in the live. I'm going to share on my page because it, was, it has been difficult to connect with this morning, so I'm hoping it's all worked out, but I'm going to need some feedback from friends. Let's, like Gloria, hi Gloria, good morning. Hey, is this signal okay? Can you let me know? It was really wonky today. It wasn't wanting to connect for a while. Live now. We talk about Jacob. Okay, it is good? Oh, good, okay, great. Well, we're gonna go ahead and pray and then get started in our study for today. We're going to look at the first eight verses of um, Hosea chapter 12 plus a bonus verse. And uh, we'll see that in a second. Hi, Rhonda, good morning. Good morning. Okay, let's pray. Hmm. Lord, we turn our heart to you right now. In this moment, Lord, there's so much going on around us, so much um, demands and forces that want to pull in every possible direction. But Lord, we know what we need most is to have our hearts centered in you, to be aligned and postured in your presence. And we do that through leaning in to your word. Lord, speak to us today. We ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, here we go. We are in Hosea, the book of Hosea. I hope you guys have been loving this uh, prophet study. I'd really love to hear your feedback. We've got we've got just a couple um, couple chapters left, so I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Okay. Let's recap for a second, chapter eleven, because there's this bonus verse that I that I kind of talked about a second, just for a second at the end of last week's study. Good morning, Sandy. I want us to talk about it for another moment. And that's verse 12. So if you're looking at chapter 11, the whole chapter except for verse 12 was, was this beautiful reminder of God's heart and his love for Israel. It was this, you know, it, it was like a, a father to this son that was rejecting him, right? And the father's like, but ah, how can I just write you off? How can I just like move on without you, right? That was God's heart toward Israel despite their rejection of him, right? So, and then we come up to this last verse, which most of our Bibles will have this as the last verse of chapter 11. It says this, Ephraim surrounds me with lies, the house of Israel with deceit. Judah still wanders with God and he's faithful to the holy ones. And we, I, I would say, you know, I use the term beat change. <laughs> like, wait a minute, there, this is a stark turn and contrast of, of the message compared to what was in the previous chapter. For this reason, the Jewish Bible actually uses this verse as verse 1 of chapter 12. And then all of the remaining verses in chapter 12 are shifted down one in the, in the complete Jewish Bible. But ours keep it in with verse 11 because of how it was, it was grouped. Uh, let me make sure there's, there we go. Okay. So I think that's pretty cool to notice, especially when we're paying attention to themes, right? We're paying attention to the overall message along with like, you know, laser focusing in on some of these words and phrases that give greater meaning for you and I to understand this, all right? So he, he mentions Ephraim, and remember that Ephraim was a name 
but the name represents the northern kingdom of Israel. It was the region of the tribe of Ephraim. Uh, that region became kind of the central hub and the ruling space for the northern kingdom when they split away from being a part of the whole. All right, so it says that Ephraim surrounds me with lies. The house of Israel, meaning the like the leadership with deceit. It mentions Judah. Judah is, is the, the name of the southern kingdom. And so Judah is where Bethlehem is, um, where Jerusalem is, that those nations are in, I mean, those cities are in this lower area. It says for right now, so Judah still wanders, and that word wanders, I think, is a really good um, description of Judah because, did I highlight it? There you go. Judah is nowhere near perfect, following God, not one bit. However, they're, they're better than the, than the northern kingdom by far. So at this time, Judah is still making, the leaders still kind of come in, and they try to bring the ship, right? They try to right the ship that seems like it veers for a liter or two into the wrong direction. Hi, Suzanne. Good morning. Happy Tuesday, right? Okay. Let's get into chapter 12, the way that you and I likely see it in our Bible with this being verse one. God's case against Jacob's heirs. This is the theme. Now, it mentions Jacob. We're going to talk about that. That's pretty cool. All right, verse 1 says, Ephraim, Israel, chases the wind and pursues the east wind. He continually multiplies lies and violence. Well, this chasing the wind is, is this poetic statement to mean like they're not chasing something of substance, right? They're not chasing anything of substance. It's like they're completely in the wrong pursuit, in the wrong direction, and, and it's not something they can actually catch, right? Um, when it says here, he continually multiplies lies and violence. The, um, I think that's the Wycliffe Bible Commentary. No, Wesleyan Bible Commentary. Am I right? Yeah, Wesleyan Bible Commentary. They had mapped out these cases, these charges that God has been making against Israel so far in this word from the prophet Hosea. And we've seen two mentioned already. One was this lack of experiential knowledge of God. They're supposed to be God's people, but really they don't know him in a personal way at all. Second, a lack of faithfulness to their covenant with God. Their agreement that was supposed to offer their blessing and protection being God's you know, chosen people, they've not held up any end of it, right? Number three that's being laid out now in chapter 12 is their utter lack of sincerity and truthfulness. So now we're getting to, uh, we, we mentioned kind of faithfulness to the covenant. This is getting even more into kind of their, their nature, their, their heart, someone that lacks sincerity and any measure of truthfulness. And if we look back at that verse again, the phrases that it said. Oh, hi, Melanie, Darlene, Annetta, good morning. It says, uh, oops, sorry, that's driving me crazy. There you go. Um, he continually multiplies lies and violence. That's, that's what's being stirred up by them. It's not... It's not good stuff, right? So coming to like this root of their nature is, is largely skewed. All right, this is the second half of verse one. I didn't include it before because we're kind of going, but it says this, he makes a covenant with Assyria and olive oil is carried to Egypt. Now we know, we know what that's talking about. Right? If we know the, the history of God's people during this time, we know that uh, the northern kingdom of Israel for a while tried to keep Assyria, the Assyrian Empire, at bay because they were going to come in and invade. So they became this uh, tribute nation and they would give uh, money and gold to keep Assyria happy and at bay. 
But we also know that they were getting sick of that, not to mention the nation was being robbed and they were losing all of their wealth, all of that gold that was being carried off to Assyria. And so they're like, we have to fight against Assyria. We can't keep doing this. And they secretly reach out to Egypt. They try to say, Egypt, you and I, let's band together and let's, let's just get Assyria out of this space. And so that's when it's saying olive oil is carried to Egypt, it's saying they're trying to appeal to them and make whatever agreement they can. Yeah. So that points, don't you think that that points to, um, what's the right word? I'm trying to think of the right word when, well, like more than deceptive, more than deceitful, um, I don't know, what, what's what's a more eloquent word for sneaky? You know, I don't, I don't know. But that there are, that's kind of like this, this nature that's sleazy, sneaky. They're, they're trying to work their best deal for themselves, aren't they? And we can say that, but we also know it's human nature, right? So we can kind of relate to that. Chances are, if we were in that position, we might, we might do the same thing, you know? Verse two, underhanded. That's a great word, Suzanne. Thank you. Underhanded. They're very underhanded. Verse two, the Lord also has a dispute with Judah. Now, wait a minute. Just a second ago, in, in chapter 11, it had mentioned Judah, but it said Judah still wanders, right? But at the time, they're kind of, um, they're still following God, but they're, they're wandering, right? But they're still attempting to, you know, when it mentioned the holy ones, it's talking about the priests and the Levites, that kind of stuff. They're, they're, they're not fully off the, the deep end yet. Gloria, cunning, that's another good word. Yeah. Thank you. I feel like sometimes I reach for a word and I, my brain has just lost it. You ever have those days? <laughs> Feels like a Monday, but it's not. Okay. So he mentions Judah, so we should just be aware, right? There, This is teasing that Judah is not far behind from Israel. Yeah. It says he, God, is about to punish Jacob according to his own conduct. He will repay him based on his actions. Jacob. That name should sound familiar, right? Do you know that Jacob is actually a faith patriarch, not just for the Christian faith, for the Jewish faith as well, and for the Islamic faith? They see Jacob as um, a founding father of faith. Um, so Jacob, we when we think of Jacob, we tend to sometimes romanticize him. Maybe we think of the latter part of him, but it's good for us to remember who Jacob was, for real, right? Let's remember Jacob as a whole. Uh, oh, I thought it was cool, I'll show you first that the name of Jacob, it means something, right? Hebrew names were often chosen, uh, especially in scripture, they're highlighted for what their name represents. So in the case of Jacob, Jacob can mean to follow, or be behind, which twin, Jacob and Esau, right? Uh, it can mean to supplant or overreach. That's, that's really starting to hit it. it. It also connects with the Hebrew, Hebrew root word of heel, right? Because Jacob came out like reaching the heel of his brother. It can also mean, may God protect. We see in Genesis 32. So you'll read the story of Jacob uh, in like Gen in the 20s of Genesis. And in Genesis 32, God renames Jacob. He gives him a new name. Israel. Israel. So they're mentioning Jacob. Uh, God is mentioning the, uh, Jacob in this word. And it's a really good it's a really fitting representative of Israel as a whole. And, and it, to me, I'd say like, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. 
Why? Well, well, let's see some of the stuff that they mentioned. So in this word, verses three and four, so it says, you know, God is going to repay Jacob for his actions, right? He's going to be punished. And then we see this. Verse three, in the womb, he grasped his brother's heel. As an adult, he wrestled with God. Do you remember those moments? Really quick, there's a, there's a moment with Jacob. Um, do you remember the, the birthright? I, I don't know if you remember this story of Jake. It always stuck out to me. One, I'm a twin, right? I have a twin sister. I'm the younger. <laughs> I'm the younger. I should have been the older, right? I should have been first. But, you know, there was a C-section, an emergency kind of thing. And I was second, right? Well, Jacob and Esau, they were very different in their in their character, in their nature. And it said, you know, Esau loved to hunt. He loved to be out, you know, getting dirty, um, working in the fields, working with crops and harvest. It always said Jacob, Jacob was more of a homebody. He, he liked being at home. He was a mama's boy. And there's just one moment where Jacob is inside. He's not working. He's inside, and his brother comes in after a really hard day, really, really hard day, and he sees his brother eating this soup, and it looks so good, so good, that Esau's like, I gotta have that soup. I like, I gotta have it. And so, kind of think it's a little flippant, the, the thing that he offers. You think he can't possibly, but it was basically, he gives him his birthright. He's like, I'll, I'll give you my birthright if you give me that soup. And one might say, well, you know, maybe, maybe they were really, they were kids, you know, they were dumb. Maybe he didn't think that that would actually be held, right? Or, or maybe, maybe it was Jacob that asked for it. I'm forgetting now, remind me. But either way, he traded his birthright with his brother for a bowl of soup. That actually it paints a picture of Jacob you can see and so even even here so it mentions he grasped at his brother's heel this idea of I'm going to reach beyond I'm going to try to take more than what's mine and then it mentions as an adult he wrestled with God so there's this moment again Jacob he wanted something for himself and he was going to go after it he was going to get it right um it actually caused <laughs> caused some damage but in the moment, it said, so Jacob struggled with the angel and prevailed. Faith Life Study Bible points out here that the comparison, oh, hi, Flo, hi, Hannah, good morning, guys. The comparison with Jacob, Israel and Jacob right now, the things that are being mentioned about Jacob are not great things on purpose. On purpose, they're highlighting his reputation for deceit, his desire for personal gain. He was very selfishly motivated. I think about um, reputations of people. We know, man, the story of Jacob is so much more than that, right? He wouldn't be elevated uh, in the way that he is. Now he's not perfect at all. We see it, but, but there's so much more to Jacob than those moments. And those moments don't shine a pretty light on him, do they? They don't. It is on purpose. The writer is specifically highlighting, rather than the glorious things that make someone feel strong, they're highlighting weaknesses in Jacob. On purpose. Okay, so it says, after it's, it mentioned that, you know, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. It says, he wept and sought his favor. He found him at Bethel. And there he spoke with him. So through this moment, there's this radical moment where Jacob encounters God and it changes him. And what's really interesting, you see how they highlighted Bethel? We, we've talked about Bethel before. Bethel was, was at one point this beautiful location of significant spiritual heritage, right? This is where Jacob really met God in a, in a powerful, personal way was Bethel. 
And if anything, I, I, when I see that highlighted the way it is here, and I just think, man, what a sad state that Bethel is not like that anymore. That Bethel is not the place where people radically encounter God. In fact, it's now a place at this moment where there are, uh, there's a golden calf that was, you know, raised and built there for people to worship pagan, you know? Okay. So it mentions that moment. Um, yeah, you, you can read about Jacob's encounter with God in Genesis 28 into 32. 32 is where God changes his name. Okay. Verse 5 and 6. Really cool kind of interjection because it takes the attention off of who he's just been talking about so much, which is Israel and, and Judah and then Jacob, right? Verse 5 says, The Lord is the God of armies. The Lord is his name. You must return to your God. Maintain love and justice. Always put your hope in God. It takes this minute where the verse is fully focused on Yahweh. 100%. Who's the one that gave the radical encounter with Jacob? The one that Jacob was brought to his knees. He wept and he begged for favor from. It was the Lord. The one Lord. And that is their heritage, right? That is their spiritual heritage. And it, it just hits all the more that that is not where they are now. At the time of this, they are far from that heritage. They are far from Yahweh. And so this verse even says, you must return. You must return to your God. And then it mentions maintain love and justice and always put your hope in God. That, this idea of love and justice, there are people who don't follow Yahweh that embrace the idea of love and justice, right? But here, at the time of Israel, do you remember what, what Israel was being called out for in this moment? They were not faithful to God, right? They didn't have firsthand experience of God. And... There's not a shred of truthfulness and integrity in them anymore. So aligning to God, this returning to God, would be bringing about a character shift that needed to happen, right? This idea of love and justice. Where are you going to find that? Realigning to the Lord. And then where will your hope come from? Your hope will come from the Lord. We can find hope in a lot of things, guys. Um, hope isn't just arbitrarily like a spiritual God thing. No, we place our hope in a lot of things. And sometimes it is a completely inappropriate thing for us to be turning to and placing our hope for help and a secure future in. Stark contrast. So this is who should be exalted, and this is what Israel should be doing, but it's not what they're doing. And so the last two verses for today highlight that. Ooh, I love this flow. Flow says, whenever you let God into your life, that always changes you. Oh, that's true, isn't it? Yep, yep. Last two verses that we're looking at today are verses 7 and 8. And this is the contrast. This is the stark difference of where Israel is. It's not love and justice and hope in the Lord. This is where they are. Verse 7 says, A merchant loves to extort with dishonest scales in his hands. So there's this dishonesty, right? I'm going to work things to my advantage, even if it means that I'm kind of cheating people. And then verse 8, but Ephraim thinks, how rich I have become. I made it all myself in all my earnings. No one can find any iniquity in me that I could be punished for. I want you to think about this. Think about the heart that is, oops, wrong way. Uh, nope. <laughs> there. Nope. That. There. <laughs> there. Okay. Um, 
If we look here at the heart that's represented, there's so much to this. Verse 8, oh, it really gets me because I think we can lean in a lot closer to this than we want to admit. Ephraim, representing Israel, thinks, ah, pat on the back, how rich I've become. And I made it all myself. Chances are they kind of cheated their way to get it too, right? We see that because of the verse right before in verse 7, saying that they had dishonest scales that then got them wealth. And they're patting themselves on the back. And, and that last phrase that I have in purple, no one can find any iniquity in me that I could be punished for. It's not saying I'm innocent. Do you catch that? It's not saying I'm innocent, I am above reproach. No, that's saying I was sneaky enough that I've not gotten caught. There's huge deceptiveness there. Guys, it... It hits on something, I just feel like I need to say it again. We need to be mindful of a posture that, that some actually promote as Christian, um, where, where it's following Jesus so that I get the benefits, right? Oh, I'm gonna follow Jesus because when I tithe and when I you know, stomp my feet and have enough faith, I am making God give me the thing I want. And then, and then you think, oh, well, my wealth is because I have more favor from God because I've done the right things. <sighs> Do you recognize that that's not, that's not scripture? That that's actually way more like idol worship than you want to admit? You've turned God into a genie? And you've been so arrogant to elevate yourself to think that your wealth is because you are, you know, you're cracking the code on what gets God's favor and you use his name, but it's very selfish. Guys, that, that's what Israel did for the long time. And then for a while, God just disappears into the background. But, but that posture, you see it here. After a while, people will, will think, oh, I did this. I got this. Why? Because I had enough faith. Because I, you know, worked the system for my benefit, you know? That's touted in, in Christian circles. And I, I, just, I just tell you that, that you need to check that. I call it out because I've been there. I've been there. And, and I would look around and think, oh, you know, God's giving me favor and I'm having success because we're doing the right things and because God likes us. And therefore, maybe other people aren't doing things with their money that, that we're doing. And that's why God is blessing us instead of, you see that? Complete arrogance. That's what that is. Pride and arrogance and ego. And God is actually not in that. How quick, how quick someone can fall and the thing is, th that's the state of Israel in this moment. They, they've carried God's name. They've said, you know, we're God's people, even though they're flat out seeking after and pursuing and worshiping other stuff, right? But they're, they're still God's people. They're still Israel. That sets them up for this season of deep heartache because the, the prophets would come and would, would try and call out that improper alignment and focus where, where Yahweh, really knowing Yahweh, not for what you get out of him, but just knowing him, that's Yahweh's just in the background. He's a name that we bear because we think it gives us stuff. That's the posture that led Israel to this moment. And I pray we don't miss that. I, I pray you, you see that we have this like sober humility and awareness of how close we are to that posture, how careful we need to be and remain. When we're talking about humility of heart, right? This humble spirit, it, it's not talking like you're a little nobody, but it's, it's recognizing who you are apart from God and it's making your focus and intention less about you period and more about God and his kingdom 
That's the posture. That's what he wants of us, guys. And <sighs> Lord, help. Let's just pray that right now as we wrap up. Lord, we ask for your help because the, the world and the forces around really want to push material wealth. And, and it's really easy in our specifically American church circle to attach wealth and prosperity in, in this world as the evidence of your spirit rather than the gifts of the spirit. Lord, help us. Help us repent. Help us turn from that pattern and help us to seek your face sincerely, to be broken in your spirit, broken in your presence. And that the real evidence of your spirit would become evident in us. The fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Lord, let those grow in our heart. Let us pursue those in your name. We ask these things. Amen. 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 Guys, thank you for joining me today. Do me a favor. Can you hit the share button? We, we've got, so we're in chapter 12. We're going to pick up in chapter 12. The second half of it we'll do on, um, wow, today's already Tuesday. So we'll do it on Thursday. And we've got maybe a week or two at the most left. I doubt it'll be two full weeks. But it's a great time to invite someone in as we're wrapping this up. Develop the habit of getting into scripture, seeking the Lord's heart, seeking to understand and just anchor ourselves in him. We need it because otherwise the forces around us will want to shift you to pursue anything else but him. So help us, Lord. Yeah. Have a great day, guys. I will see you on Thursday and we'll pick back up. Take care.